Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Shane by Jack Schaefer. And Schaefer is the uh, author, of course. I'm Justin McCarthy. Just read this book aloud for all of you. So last chapter, we had Bob. He was playing around with an old, kind of unusable gun. Just, I don't know, I think he was playing cowboys and Indians or something. And Shane rolls up and is kind of playful with him, just toying around and being silly. But at some point, things got serious and Shane kind of went back into himself. I think he kind of went into his past in his own mind. And it seemed dark or at least very heavy. So we got that sense that... Uh, Again, that Shane has a past that we don't really know about. And he had mentioned something to Bob about guns just in general, that they're just a tool like any other tool. Uh, they're as good and as bad as the man who carries that gun. And I think that's a pretty profound statement about guns. But what we just get again is that heaviness. And then there's some drama in Shane's past. And let's see if it's going to come uh, into the future uh, as we get moving along with this book. So let's hop in, see what's going down. Chapter six, more than the summer was over, the season of friendship in our valley was fading with the sun's warmth. Fletcher was back and he had his contract. He was talking in town that he would need the whole range again. The homesteaders would have to go. He was a reasonable man. He was saying in his smooth way, and he would pay a fair price for any improvements they had put in. But we knew what Lake Luke Fletcher would call a fair price. And we had no intention of leaving. The land was ours by right of settlement, guaranteed by the government. Only we knew, too, how far away the government was from our valley way up there in the territory. The nearest marshal was a good hundred miles away. We did not even have a sheriff in our own town. There never had been any reason for one. When folks had any lawn to do, they would head for Sheridan, nearly a full day's ride away. Our town was small, not even organized as a town. It was growing, but it was still not much more than a roadside settlement. I'll just give some context. Imagine you call 911 and it takes half a day for them to get to your house. I mean, even a couple hours is, I mean, that's, that's frightening when you think about that. But that's how life was in this area at the time. The first people there were three or four miners who had come prospecting after the blow up of the Bighorn Mining Association about 20 years before and had found gold traces leading to a moderate vein in the jutting rocks that partially closed off the valley where it edged into the plain. You could not have called it a strike for others that followed were soon disappointed. Those first few, however, had done fairly well and had brought in their families and a number of helpers. So it was a gold rush, a few people got rich, People after them, not so much, not, not much gold left, but people were coming now. Then a stage and freighting line had picked the site for a relay post. That meant a place where you could get drinks as well as horses. And before long, the cowboys from the ranches out on the plain and Fletcher's spread in the valleys, valley were drifting in of an evening. With us homesteaders coming now, one or two more almost every season, the town was taking shape. Already there were several stores, a harness and a blacksmith shop, and nearly a dozen houses. Just a year before, the men had put together a, a one-room schoolhouse. Sam Grafton's place was the biggest. He had a general store with several rooms for living quarters back of it in one half of his rambling building, a saloon with a long bar and tables for cards and the like in the other half. Upstairs, he had some rooms he rented to stray drummers or anyone else stranded overnight. He acted as our postmaster, an elderly man, a close bargainer, but honest in all his dealings. Sometimes he served as a sort of magistrate in minor disputes. So he was even kind of like a judge if people had, had a disagreement. His wife was dead. His daughter Jane kept house for him and was our school teacher when school was in session. Even if we had a sheriff, he would have been Fletcher's man. Fletcher was the power in the valley in those days. We homesteaders had been around only a few years, and the other people still thought of us as there by his sufferance, like only by him allowing us to be there. He had been running cattle through the whole valley at the time the miners arrived, having bought or bulldozed out the few small ranchers there ahead of him. A series of bad years working up to the dry summer and terrible winter of 86 had cut his herds about the time the first of the homesteaders moved in, and he had not objected too much. But now there were seven of us in all, and the number rising each year. 
It was a certain thing, Father used to say, that the town would grow and swing our way. Mr. Grafton knew that too, I guess, but he was a careful man who never let thoughts about the future interfere with present business. The others were kind to veer with the prevailing wind. Fletcher was the big man in the valley, so they looked up to him and tolerated us. Led to it, they probably would have helped him run us out. With him out of the way, they would just as willingly accept us. And Fletcher was back with a contract in his pocket, wanting his full range again. So it seems like a lot of people in town, they could go either way. They wouldn't mind if they were with Fletcher. They wouldn't mind if they were with these homesteaders. But it seems like a conflict between the two is inevitable at this point. There was a hurried council in our house soon as the news was around at Fletcher's back. Our neighbor toward town, Lou Johnson, who heard it in Grafton store and spread the word and arrived first. He was followed by Henry Shipstead, who had the place next to him, the closest to town. These two had been the original homesteaders, staking out their 180s two years before the drought and riding out Fletcher's annoyance until the cut in his herds gave him other worries. They were solid, dependable men old line farmers who had come west from Iowa. You could not say quite as much for the rest, straggling in at intervals. James Lewis and Ed Howes were two middle-aged cowhands who had grown dissatisfied and tagged father into the valley, coming pretty much on his example. Lacking his energy and drive, they had not done too well and could be easily discouraged. Frank Torrey, from farther up the valley was a nervous, fidgety man with a querulous wife and a string of dirty kids growing longer every year. He was always talking about pulling up stakes and heading for California, but he had, he had a stubborn streak in him. And he was always saying too, that he'd be damned if he'd make tracks just because some big hatted rancher wanted him to. Ernie Wright, who had the last stand up the valley butting out into the range still used by Fletcher, was probably the weakest of the lot. Not in any physical way. He was a husky, likable man, so dark complected that there was rumors he was part Indian. He was always singing and telling tall stories, but he would be off hunting when he should be working. And he had a quick temper that would trap him in doing fool things without taking thought. He was as serious as the rest of them that night. Mr. Grappen had said that this time Fletcher meant business. His contract called for all the beef he could drive in the next five years, and he was determined to push the chance to the limit. So this Fletcher seems to think, I need this land to raise a bunch of cattle, get some beef, and these homesteaders are in my way. They need to get the heck out of here. That's the, that's the quick summary. But what can he do? Asked Frank Torrey. The land's ours as long as we live on it, and we get title in three years. Some of you fellows already proved up. He won't really make trouble, chimed in James Lewis. Fletcher's never been the shooting kind. He's a good talker, but talk can't hurt us. Several of the others nodded. Johnson and Shipstead did not seem to be so sure. Father had not said anything yet, and they all looked at him. Jim's right, he admitted. Fletcher hasn't ever let his boys get careless that way. Not yet, anyhow. That ain't saying he wouldn't. There wasn't any other way. There's a hard streak in him. But he won't get real tough for a while. I don't figure he'll start moving cattle in now till spring. My guess is he'll try putting pressure on us this fall and winter. See if he can wear us down. He'll probably start right here. He doesn't like any of us. But he doesn't like me most. That's true. Ed Howes was expressing the unspoken verdict that father was their leader. How do you figure he'll go about it? My guess on that, father said, drowling now and smiling a grim little smile like he knew he was holding a good hole card in a tight game. My guess on that is that he'll begin by trying to convince Shane here that it isn't healthy to be working with me. You mean the way he began Ernie Wright? Yes, father cut him short. I mean the way he did with young Morley. I was peeping around the corner of my little room. I saw Shane sitting off to one side, listening quietly as he had been right along. He did not seem the least bit surprised. He did not seem the least bit interested in finding out what had happened to young Morley. I knew what had. I had seen Morley come back from town, bruised and a beaten man. 
and gather his things and curse father for hiring him and ride away without once looking back. Yet Shane sat there quietly as if what had happened to Morley had nothing to do with him. He simply did not care what it was. And then I understood why. It was because he was not Morley. He was Shane. Father was right. In some strange fashion, the feeling was abroad that Shane was a marked man. Attention was on him as a sort of symbol. By taking him on, Father had accepted in a way a challenge from the big ranch across the river. What had happened to Morley had been a warning, and Father had deliberately answered it. The long unpleasantness, unpleasantness was sharpened now after the summer lull. The issue in our valley was plain and would in time have to be pushed to a showdown. If Shane could be driven out, there would be a break in the homestead ranks, a defeat going beyond the loss of a man into the realm of prestige and morale. It could be the crack in the dam that weakens the whole structure and finally lets the flood, lets through the flood. So if Joe can get driven out of the land, then everybody else is going to follow because Joe seems to be the toughest, the leader of the bunch. The people in town were more curious than ever. Not now so much about Shane's past as about what he might do if Fletcher tried any move against him. They would stop me and ask me questions when I was hurrying to and from school. I knew that father would not want me to say anything. I pretended that I did not know what they were talking about. But I used to watch Shane closely myself and wonder how all the slow climbing tenseness in our valley could be so focused on just one man. And he seemed to be so indifferent to it. For of course, he was aware of it. He never missed anything, yet he went about his work as usual, smiling frequently now at me, bantering mother at mealtimes in his courteous manner, arguing amiably as before with father on plans for next year. The only thing that was different was that there appeared to be a lot of new activity across the river. It was surprising how often Fletcher's cowboys were finding jobs to do within view of our place. Then one afternoon, when we were stowing away the second and last cutting of hay, one fork of the big tongs we were using to haul it up to the loft broke loose. Have to get it welded in town, Father said in disgust and began to hitch up the team. Shane stared over the river where a cowboy was riding lazily back and forth by a bunch of cattle. I'll take it in, he said. Father looked at Shane, he looked across the way, and he grinned. All right, it's as good a time as any. He slapped down the final buckle and started for the house. Just a minute, I'll be ready. Take it easy, Joe. Shane's voice was gentle, but it stopped Father in his tracks. I said, I'll take it in. Father whirled to face him. Damn it all, man. Do you think I'd let you go alone? Suppose they... He bit down on his own words. He wiped a hand slowly across his face and he said what I had never heard him say to any man. I'm sorry, he said. I, I should have known better. He stood there silently watching as Shane gathered up the reins and jumped to the wagon seat. I was afraid while the father would stop me, so I waited till Shane was driving out of the lane. I ducked behind the barn around the end of the corral and hopped into the wagon going past. As I did, I saw the cowboy cross the river, spin his horse, and ride rapidly off in the direction of the ranch house. So basically, just so you guys have this full context, normally they're just at the house. This isn't like, you know, you're in town, you go off to your local supermarket, whatever, it's Publix, I don't know what you guys have where you're at, um, Ralph's in California, where I was at before. But you don't go out to dinner and go into town often and come back to your house. You're usually just at your house. And now they need to have something fixed. So it needs to be brought into town. So Shane says, all right, I'm going in. But what's that going to mean? Are those cowboys going to follow him into town? That kind of thing. Shane saw it too, the cowboys. And it seemed to give him a grim amusement. He reached backwards and hauled me over the seat and sat me beside him. You starrets like to mix into things. For a moment, I thought he might send me back. Steady grinned at me. I'll buy you a jackknife when we hit town. He did, a dandy big one with two blades and a corkscrew. 
After we left the tongs with a blacksmith and found the welding would take nearly an hour, I squatted on the steps on the long porch across the front of Grafton's building, busy whittling, while Shane stepped into the saloon side and ordered a drink. Will Atke, Grafton's thin, sad-faced clerk and bartender, was behind the bar and several other men were loafing at one of the tables. It was only a few moments before two cowboys came galloping down the road. They slowed to a walk about 50 yards off and with a show of nonchalance, ambled the rest of the way to Grafton's, dismounting and looping their reins over the rail in front. One of them I had seen often, a young fellow everyone called Chris, who had worked with Fletcher several years and was known for a gay manner and reckless courage. The other was new to me, a sallow pinch cheek man, not much older, who looked like he had crowded a lot of hard living into his years. He must have been one of the new hands Fletcher had been bringing into the valley since he got his contract. Just a quick note, Chris, him saying a gay manner, not that he likes like the same sex or something like that, but he's just like a happy, jolly type of guy. But also, you know, as you notice, kind of reckless courage. So he's a jolly young man, but like, you know, I'm going to start a fight if I need to fight. And then the other guy looks like he's been through a lot in life, like a, a tough, uh, you know, hardened guy. They paid no attention to me. So Chris and the other cowboy. They stepped softly up on the porch and to the window of the saloon part of the building. As they peered through, Chris nodded and jerked his head toward the inside. The new man stiffened. He leaned closer for a better look. Abruptly, he turned clear about and came right down past me and went over to his horse. Chris was startled and hurried after him. They were both so intent they did not realize I was there. The new man was lifting the reins back over his horse's head when Chris caught his arm. But what the hell? I'm leaving. Huh? I, I don't get it. I'm leaving. Now for good. Hey, listen, do you know that guy? I didn't say that. There ain't nobody can claim I said that. I'm leaving. That's all. You can tell Fletcher. This is a hell of a country up here anyhow. Chris was getting mad. I might have known, he said. Scared, huh? Yellow? Color rushed into the new man's sallow, a pale face. But he climbed on his horse and swung out from the rail. You can call it that, he said flatly and started down the road, out of town, out of the valley. Chris was standing still by the rail, shaking his head in wonderment. Hell, he said to himself, I'll brace him myself. He stalked up on the porch into the saloon. I dashed into the store side over to the opening between the two big rooms. I crouched on a box just inside the store where I could hear everything and see most of the other room. It was long and fairly wide. The bar curved out from the opening and ran all the way along the inner wall to the back wall, which closed off a room Grafton used as an office. There was a row of windows on the far side, too high for anyone to look in from outside. A small stairway behind them led up to a sort of balcony across the back with doors opening to several little rooms. Shane was leaning easily with one arm on the bar, his drink in his other hand, when Chris came to perhaps six feet away and called for a whiskey bottle and a glass. Chris pretended he did not notice Shane at first and bobbed his head in greetings and men at the table. They were a pair of mule skinners who made regular trips into the valley, freighting in goods, from, in goods for Grafton and the other shops. I could have sworn that Shane, studying Chris in his effortless way, was somehow disappointed. Chris waited until he had his whiskey and had gulped a stiff shot. Then he deliberately looked Shane over like he had just spotted him. Hello, farmer, he said. He said as if he did not like farmers. Shane regarded him with grave attention. Speaking to me, he asked mildly and finished his drink. Hell, there ain't nobody else standing there. Here, have a drink of this. Chris shoved his bottle along the bar. Shane poured himself a generous slug and raised it to his lips. I'll be damned, flipped Chris. So you drink whiskey? Shane tossed off the rest in his glass and set it down. I've had better, he said, as friendly as could be. But this will do. 
Chris slapped his leather chaps with a loud smack. He turned to take in the other men. Did you hear that? This farmer drinks whiskey? I didn't think these plow pushing dirt grubbers drank anything stronger than soda pop. Some of us do, said Shane, Shane, friendly as before. Then he was no longer friendly and his voice was like winter frost. You've had your fun, man. It's mighty young fun. Now run home and tell Fletcher to send a grown-up man next time. He turned away and sang out to Will Atke. Do you have any soda pop? I'd like a bottle. Will hesitated, looked kind of funny, and scuttled past me into the storeroom. He came back right away with a bottle of the pop, grabbed and kept there for us school kids. Chris was standing quiet, not so much mad, I would have said, as puzzled. It was as though they were playing some queer game and he was not sure of the next move. He sucked on his lower lip for a while. Then he snapped his mouth and began to look elaborately around the room, sniffing loudly. He's going, hey, Will, he called. What's been happening in there? It smells. That ain't no clean cattle man smell. That's plain dirty barnyard, he stared at Shane. You, farmer, what are you and start raising out there? Pigs? Shane was just taking hold of the bottle Will had fetched him. His hand closed on it and the knuckles showed white. He moved slowly, almost unwillingly, to face Chris. Every line of his body was as taut as stretched whipcord was alive and somehow rich with an immense eagerness. There was that fierce concentration in him, filling him, blazing in his eyes. In that moment, there was nothing in the room for him but that mocking man only a few feet away. The big room was so quiet, the stillness fairly hurt. Chris stepped back involuntarily one pace, two, then pulled up erect, and still nothing happened. The lean muscles along the sides of Shane's jaw were rigid like rock. Then the breath pent in him broke the stillness with a soft sound as it left his lungs. He looked away from Chris, past him, over the top to the swinging doors beyond, over the roof of the shed across the road, on into the distance where the mountains loomed in their own unending loneliness. Quietly he walked, the bottle forgotten in his hands so close by Chris as almost to brush him, yet apparently not even seeing him, through the doors and was gone. I heard a sigh of relief near me. Mr. Grafton had come up from somewhere behind me. He was watching Chris with a strange, ironic quirk at his, at his mouth corners. Chris was trying not to look pleased with himself, but he swaggered as he went to the doors and peered over them. You saw it, Will. He called over his shoulder. He walked out on me. Chris pushed up his hat and rolled back on his heels and laughed. With a bottle of soda pop, too. He was still laughing as he went out and we heard him ride away. That boy's a fool, Mr. Grafton muttered. Will Atke came sidling over to Mr. Grafton. I, I never pegged Shane for a play like that, he said. He was afraid, Will. Yeah, that's what was so funny. I would have guessed he could have taken Chris. Mr. Grafton looked at Will as he did often, like he was a little sorry for him. No, Will. He wasn't afraid of Chris. He was afraid of himself. Mr. Grafton was thoughtful and perhaps sad, too. There's trouble ahead, Will. The worst trouble we've ever had. He noticed me, realizing my presence. Better skip along, Bob, and find your friend. Do you think he got that bottle for himself? True enough, Shane had it waiting for me at the blacksmith shop. Cherry pop, the kind I favored most. But I could not enjoy it much. Shane was so silent and stern. He had slipped back into the dark mood that was on him when he first came riding up our road. I did not dare say anything 
Only once did he speak to me, and I knew he did not expect me to understand or to answer. Why should a man be smashed because he has courage and does what he's told? Life's a dirty business, Bob. I could like that boy. And he turned inward again to his own thoughts and stayed the same until we had loaded the tongs in the wagon and we were all well started home. Then the closer we came, the more cheerful he was. By the time we swung in toward the barn, he was the way I wanted him again crinkling his eyes at me and gravely joshing me about the Indians I would scalp with my new knife. Father popped out the barn door so quick you could tell he had been itching for us to return. He was busting with curiosity, but he would not come straight out with a question to Shane. He tackled me instead. See any of your cowboy heroes in town? Shane cut in ahead of me. One of Fletcher's crew chased us in to pay his respects. No, I said, proud of my information. There was two of them. Two? Shane said it. Father was the one who was not surprised. What'd the other one do? He, he went up on the porch and looked in the window where you were and came right back down and rode off. Back to the ranch? The other way. He said he was leaving for good. Father and Shane looked at each other. Father was smiling. One down and you didn't even know it. What did you do to the other? Nothing. He passed a few remarks about farmers. I went back to the blacksmith shop. Father repeated it, spacing the words like there might be meanings between them. You went back to the blacksmith's shop. I was worried that he must be thinking what Will Atkey did. Then I knew nothing like that had, ever, had even entered his mind. He switched to me. Who was it? It was Chris. Father was smiling again. He had not been there, but he had the whole thing clear. Fletcher was right to send two. Young ones like Chris need to hunt in pairs or they might get hurt. He chuckled in a sort of wry amusement. Chris must have been considerably surprised when the other fellow skipped. And more when you walked out. It was too bad the other one didn't stick around. Yes, Shane said, it was. The way he said it sobered father. I hadn't thought of that. Chris is just cocky enough to take it wrong. That can make things plenty unpleasant. Yes, said Shane again. It can. All right. So what I think this ending is meaning here uh is that you know chris is this somewhat of an arrogant like i can i can take people on type person and shane just walked past them almost like he's a nobody now that will atkey and maybe others might think oh shane's chicken he's just walking away from a fight but i think most sober and thoughtful people know that no he didn't just walk away like he was scared he walked away like i don't want any trouble because who knows what I might do to this guy. Uh, and I, I think what is happening here in this conversation is that Chris probably realizes that this guy just punked him as such. Like he just walked past him like, oh, you're a nobody to me. And people like Chris, if you ever encountered them, they might take that as a bigger affront or they might be more upset at that than even getting their butt kicked. Because it's kind of like you super disrespected them. You didn't even pay attention to me. I'm, you're acting like I'm a nobody. Well, I'm somebody. So I think Joe and Shane are realizing together there that uh, that's not the end of this trouble, right? And I think we, we probably can all see that at this point. They're, we're headed for some, maybe some fighting to come. We're going to see. Um, all right. So let's see. What face do we want? What face? You know, let's do the face of that cowboy who ran away. So basically, he peeked in the bar, the saloon, because they're about to supposedly go rough some guy up and scare him out of town. We're going to scare the shame. So he's just getting a look at who this guy is. He peeks in and he's like, and he, he jet, he's like, jets off. I'm out of here. I'm not sticking around with this guy. So clearly, he's scared of shame. 
Now, we don't know why, we don't know what the deal is, but he saw that this was this Shane or the guy that he had seen somewhere in the past and he's out. So let's get his face the moment he sees Shane. And remember, it's the moment he sees Shane and, and Shane is the guy he's supposed to be going in there to beat up or to run out of town, okay? So he peeks in and he sees Shane. That's my face. What do you have? Curious, curious myself, get it done. And if you have any questions on this chapter or the book, send them my way as always. You can reach me, let me see what the best way to, to contact me. You can reach me at jesse at jessemccarthy.com. And you can always look at all the past uh, chapters and read about what's going on over there at jessemccarthy.com. And uh, that's it. I hope you guys have a great weekend if you're listening on the weekend. A great week if it's a weekday and we will see you next weekend by sunday 9 p.m adios everyone